Welcome to Chat with the Lawyer. I'm your host, Walla Blagay, and today we're honored to have attorney Anthony Davis with the Maryland Legal Aid. As you know, Legal Aid is very important, probably one of the most important organizations in um, in the state of Maryland because it provides legal services to those who cannot afford it, those in need. And that's one of the biggest things that people say is that they want a lawyer, they can't afford a lawyer, and often, often it leads to disaster at the end without a lawyer. So we're lucky to have Maryland Legal Aid here to save us. Um, so Attorney Davis, um, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I feel that Maryland Legal Aid is as important as uh, your introduction said. We appreciate being here. All right. So tell us, um, how did you get in? How did you get to Legal Aid? Oh, how did I get to Legal Aid? For a number of years, uh, since about 2005, I was in private practice. Um, I had the good fortune of practicing with some smaller firms. Um, in my um, road to being a lawyer, uh, because I'm a transplant, I'm, I'm new here, uh, I didn't have a job, so when I came here, I did almost everything. Any, uh, the firm, whatever they wanted me to do, I did it. Um, when I went to private practice, whatever came to the door, I accepted the case. Uh, I'm researching late at night to try to find the answer. And it seems like my unconventional journey in different practice areas uh, suited me properly for my role as a director of advocacy for consumer law. And uh, consumer law, are those areas that really touch us all. I mean, we're all consumers. Uh, so if you've bought a house, if you rented a house, you bought a car, I mean, you went shopping in the store, you're a consumer. So the different practice areas that I, um, I worked in and, I, and provided services seem to prepare me for my position now. Uh, I went to work for Legal Aid because, although I always liked being a lawyer, I didn't always like um, the, the cases that I had and, and beyond the clients that I represented, um, I always looked in the courtroom at those people who really needed the most help. So many people are unrepresented, uh, so many people have good defenses, but they just don't know how to articulate them. Um, or they just don't understand the process. They don't know how to navigate the legal process and their cases fail because of that. And too many times I've seen uh, just, you know, good people uh, with valid claims uh, just end up with a short end of the stick. So I'm happy now to be working with an organization where we're providing legal services uh, free of charge to those who really need it and the population that need it the most. Uh, these are underserved population areas whether you label them as poor, uh, disabled, elderly, uh, children uh, are often uh, the, in need of assistance as well. And uh, Legal Aid's uh, vision and mission is to represent that populace, the underserved, the poor, the low income. Uh, and the mission is to serve these people with quality legal uh, services, uh, with dignity, uh, respecting their human rights and their human values, and you know, it, it really does feel good to go to work every day and to advocate on behalf of that population. So let me ask you, let's go over Maryland Legal Aid. Now, what type of clients do they serve specifically? Because I know some people will say, I've been turned away from legal aid. Um, what, how could that happen? Well, it could happen um, for a number of reasons. Um, although legal, Maryland Legal Aid is a, we're a nonprofit, uh, we are not affiliated with a government entity, uh, so for many people, we are not the public defender's office, we are not the state's attorney's office, we are a private law firm. Um, and our services are free, but we get money from somewhere. Okay. Some of our grants uh, that enable us to do the work that we do, they have certain restrictions. So we serve a low-income populace. So there are income requirements. So what are the income requirements? If you have, depending on, uh, depending on the type of grant that funds a program, so let me give you an example. I directly see a foreclosure or legal assistance project, helping people stay in their homes. Now the grant restrictions would say that we have to, we cannot represent people who 
are above 125% of the Maryland income guideline. That makes no sense to the average person. What does that so mean? So in a, I may not have the, the figures correctly, but let's say a household of four. Now a household of four's income maybe can probably cannot be above, let's say $35,000. Now again, I'm, we have a chart, we have a table, I consult it all the time, I don't know it by heart, but if, for an example, if the guidelines say we cannot represent a, a household that is above 100, 125%, meaning they make more than $35,000 a year, then we can't provide extended services to that client. Um, other grants may uh, up the income requirements, so a household of four may be able to make 38,000, 42,000. It, it depends on the restrictions. That does not mean that we cannot provide brief advice, that you can't call us, ask us your, uh, bring us your issue, and we can point you in the right direction, refer you to someone who can serve you. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't resolve your issue by a, a phone call, uh, but it does, it may mean that we cannot uh, provide extended legal representation. We may not be able to go to court with you. Another restriction would be on citizenship. If you are a non-citizen, uh, then we are limited in the, in the services that we can provide to you. Uh, every caller that comes in, we're asking that caller to attest to their citizenship. I'm a citizen of the United States, or I am a, a legal resident of the United States, and I can provide proof but a non-citizen cannot receive all the services that we provide. Maryland Legal Aid uh, has come up with a way to kind of, uh, I don't want to say circumvent the restrictions, but has come up with a way that they can provide representation even to that group of people. And what they've done is, in a sense, they have splintered. What they've done is they have created a totally separate entity called the Maryland Center for Legal Assistance. It is not affiliated with Maryland Legal Aid. It is not um, under the restrictions of the certain grant funding that we have. They have totally separate funding. What the Maryland Center for Legal Assistance can do is they can work with the client whose income is higher. They can work with a non-citizen. Um, and they do this by way of providing help at local self-help centers and in the district courts, uh, like in Baltimore City, in the district court, uh, Maryland Center for Legal Assistance is there with a staff of attorneys. Clients can walk in and they can receive the help that Maryland Legal Aid probably could not provide because of some other restriction. Now, is this provided in Prince George's County? This is provided in, we, we have 12 agencies across the state. We are up and around in, I want to say most of them. In Prince George's County, what, I am, uh, what I'm certain that we have, there's a one-stop shop. There's a one-stop shop in the, I think it's the Largo area. We are there. We are there at the one-stop shop. So if you're coming in for other assistance, uh, job readiness trails, and, uh, skills, employment training, there's Maryland Legal Aid, we're there, we're, we're having attorneys present. You can bring your uh, legal documentations, your papers, your questions, and we can help you there. So even though, this is what I like Legal Aid, what I love about Legal Aid, even when there's an obstacle in front of us, we are working to find a way around that obstacle so we can still provide this free civil legal services to clients in need. So you said civil, so I just wanted to be clear. Yes. Does that mean that you don't provide um, legal services for criminal? We do not provide legal services in criminal cases. That would be where the public defender would come in. We do not do that. Um, you, have a right, you have a right to uh, counsel. Uh, that's why the public defender exists in criminal cases, you know, when you have the threat of going to jail. In the civil arena, you don't have that same uh, right to be appointed counsel. Uh, and that's where legal aid fills that gap. Um, in the terms of legal uh, criminal um, cases that we do assist in, um, expungements, we do provide expungement clinics. So here, we're not representing a person in a criminal case, 
but people who have criminal cases on their record, Maryland Legal Aid works to provide clinics to help you expunge that off your record. And this is important for a lot of people, uh, for example, in the nature of housing. Uh, affordable housing is a big issue, not just in Maryland, but across the nation, providing uh, quality, uh, affordable housing, safe housing for people. Uh, uh, individuals who have uh, housing vouchers, Section 8 housing and such, uh, they may be denied these vouchers because they have a criminal record, because they have certain things on their uh, record that would prevent them from uh, receiving these services. And we've, in our mission to help people attain affordable housing, uh, we have expungement clinics throughout the state in Prince George's County as well uh, to help people resolve and remove these things from their record. Janelle, can you go into the expungement program more? Okay. Now for expungement, um, many people are concerned that they want to get felonies off their records. Um, and, um, and that's probably the biggest group that really wants expungement. Do you all remove felonies off of people's records? Well, uh, again, following the laws uh, in the expungement clinic, there are currently, right now, uh, what's the, the, uh, right now, there are currently uh, laws that say which uh, convictions can be expunged and which ones cannot. Mm -hmm. That is changing. Uh, as of, I believe, uh, October 2016, the law is expanding, so a greater amount, a greater number of uh, cases, felonies included, misdemeanors, uh, convictions that were not, not expungible are going to be expungible. Uh, I don't know all of those cases because that is not a, the uh, clinic that I directly supervise, but we're in the libraries, Maryland Legal Aid. We have a lawyer in the library program. We have expungement clinics across the state um, that right now will work to remove these uh, felonies, misdemeanor convictions, the ones that the law allows. And in a few months, it's going to be expanded so a greater number. We're expecting a uh, basically a a huge number of people to uh, be uh, el eligible for expungements and to come to us for services. And that would be in October 1st, 2017? Yes, okay. October 1st, All right. so just in a few months. Right. Well, we're going to take a short break, and then when we come back, we want you to talk about the programs that you have in the consumer, consumer, um, the consumer law okay. section, right? And I want you to talk about that so people can know how to, you know, what they can benefit by reaching out to your office. Be my pleasure. Thank All you. right, so please stay tuned. We're going to have more great information for you. Thank you. I saw things differently. Others saw Sergeant Parrish in control. I saw someone struggling with the pressure to be the perfect soldier, smiling on the outside but hurting on the inside. No one saw my psychological health concerns, my invisible wounds. No one saw my pain until I tried to commit suicide. The person I was died that night. Thankfully, I got another chance. With support from the military health system, my military brothers and sisters, and my leaders, I survived my suicide attempt. I learned it's important to strive for progress, not perfection, to seek care early, and to ask for help when needed. Now I can. I will share my story with others and let them know that the military health system is there for them, with resources for every service member and their families. Take the first step. Reaching out is a sign of strength. Visit realwarriors.net or call 800-874-2273. Welcome back to Chat with the Lawyer, and I'm here with Attorney Anthony Davis from the Maryland Legal Aid. And so we're going to go back into discussion of consumer law. Now, you okay. work on those issues and those programs within uh, Maryland Legal Aid, so tell us about them. Um, my, my position at Legal Aid is a brand new position. Uh, the Director of Advocacy is a title uh, that covers, uh, that several people have, but it covers a, spe a specific area of law, mine being consumer law. Uh, there's children and families, there's uh, uh, housing and uh, consumer, uh, there's also oh, uh, pro bono and training for lawyers, elder law and such. Uh, in consumer law, being that it's new, I get to create it and kind of mold it into what I want, to, want it to be. Uh, my supervisor responsibility is over a unit called FLAP, 
It's the Foreclosure Legal Assistance Project. So tell us about that program. What, what type of services do you provide? Now, the, the, broad, the, the broad goal is to help homeowners stay in their homes. Uh, Prince George's County is among the hot spots in Maryland for uh, the number of foreclosure filings. Even though across the state foreclosures are down and across the nation foreclosure filings are down, Maryland continues to be among the leaders of foreclosures. What we're doing is we are working with homeowners to try to modify their loans so they can get a, a more affordable loan payments to cure defaults. Uh, I mean, we have homeowners that have not been able to pay a mortgage in months, some in years, five years and or let, more. Let me stop you because, you know, people are kind of baffled by this. Okay. Now, we understood in 2008 with the crisis, people understood that the foreclosure um, issue had to do with a lot of just bad loans, predatory lenders taking advantage of homeowners. But what's the issue now? That's a very good question because uh, there are talks that the foreclosure crisis, as you mentioned, is no more. But I'm here to tell you, being at the ground levels, people are still use, losing their homes. I mean, the issue continues to be, as you say, these bad loans. Even though some loans have been modified, the question is, is the, is the uh, payment an affordable payment? If you're talking about a low-income family who's at, under a uh, this has a specific amount, a family of two, $26,000 a year. Um, if you're talking about a mortgage payment that's like $1,200, $1,400, I mean, that is such a huge percentage of their monthly income that they can't pay anything else. I don't want to say that the remedies that have been put in place were just a Band-Aid, but for a lot of people, they are still not able to afford their mortgage. With the expiration of a lot of the programs, uh, the Home Affordable Modification Program is the program that many people were relying on to help get them out of this ba these bad loans. That program ended in end of 2016. So lenders can now do their own individual assessment of whether or not they can uh, modify your loan. Homes are still underwater. You know, a home on, you're paying $200,000 on a home that's worth $100,000. There are still uh, scams out there. We'll try to, we'll save your home. We'll negotiate with your lenders. Uh, don't pay your mortgage, pay us. People are doing nothing. Uh, and the homeowner's deeper in debt. Um, and there's also the issue now of reverse mortgages. Reverse mortgages are mortgages that people have already, who had owned their homes and were trying to get some of the equity out of their homes, uh, and these are elderly people over six, 60 and over, um, many of them who are not working, who are retired, they got into reverse mortgages where they were given the equity in their home, given a, a check uh, for the equity, and they don't have to pay a mortgage. What they do have to pay are the property taxes and the insurance. Many people didn't know, didn't know that, didn't understand that. And is it is there law? Does the law require? So where is the accountability for the um, for those that are prov that putting homeowners in a situation? Um, you talked about the ones that um, a family of twenty six thousand that's paying twelve to fourteen hundred dollars in the mortgage. Uh, isn't there is there any laws that put it in place that only a percentage of your um, the loan can only be a percentage of your income? Well, unfortunately, the law does not protect you from entering to, let's say, a bad loan or a loan that's not in your favor. Okay? But what we can do is that we can talk with the lenders, and lenders get a bad rap. Okay? L lenders want you to stay in your home. Lenders want you to continue paying your mortgage. Lenders are working hard to determine if they can make the loan affordable for you and also a benefit for them. Um, and, we, and they do, they, they modify a great deal of loans. Um, but the situation is really higher than even what we're dealing with. You know, it's just the housing market in general. It's just, there's so many luxury homes being built and luxury condos and such like that. But affordable housing has been a big issue for a lot of people. Home ownership, 
Um, home ownership is a lot of people's dreams. People do whatever they can to hold on to their homes and they will enter into a bad loan if it's going to help them save their house. Uh, people are always hopeful that something will turn around. Um, the, the law right now, it is ever-changing. Um, there is a, even though the modification programs that existed have ended, uh, there is a new mod program coming. It's, it's referred to as the One Mod. I don't know much about it because we haven't seen much about it. We're trying to collect all the data that we can, but we don't know what the, uh, what the, uh, the, um, the, the landscape is for people uh, as of October 1st, 2017. So let me get clarification. You said sure. that the loan modification programs expired. What programs? HAMP is the biggest program, uh, Home Affordable Modification Program. This is, the pro this is the program that was put into place to stop foreclosures, to make lenders come back to the table, to review a person's bad loan, as you put it, and to see if there was, were ways that they can help to modify that loan and make it more affordable. So if you were in a bad loan and you're paying $1,200, the loan may be modified to $900 to make it more affordable for you. It would also cure any defaults. So if you hadn't paid a mortgage and the banks stopped accepting your uh, mortgage payments uh, for a number of years, it would cure that default, which is essentially just wrap it back into the loan and you get like a fresh start. So let me also ask you a question because a lot of our viewers are um, seniors. And yes. seniors are also um, troubled by going through foreclosure process, and many of them are already retired. In that case, how do you all handle those cases? Th that's the that's an issue that we see uh, far too often, uh, and we also see it in regards to the reverse mortgage, because the reverse mortgage was introduced as a way to help that situation. If you had money, if you had equity in your home, you could pull the equity out and take those funds to kind of help you live off of. But it's backfired because, again, a lot of people find themselves in default of their other responsibilities, paying their property taxes, paying the insurance, and now they're in foreclosure. Again, what we are trying to do is to use uh, the modification process to help these homeowners to uh, Redo their, redo their mortgages to make it more affordable and to cure any defaults. Sometimes we have to use a tool like bankruptcy. And bankruptcy, specifically a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, will allow you time to cure the default when you cannot modify a loan. And it would allow you to cure default over a longer period of time without the uh, extra penalties and interest and fees that would be attached to it. Uh, it is not the route that we, uh, is our first choice of action, but it does help a homeowner stay into a home. And, but let me say this, when you're talking about a Chapter 13, the person filing needs to have a regular income. And when a person is retired and they're only receiving Social Security or, or pension, a small pension, it makes it very difficult. And, and it puts us in a difficult position because Again, we're, we're lawyers, we have to use the law and the tools that are available to us, um, but people do lose their home. People are faced with the uh, having to transition from their home to find other means of, uh, of, of housing. And that's, and that's very tough, it's hard to find that. So let me also ask you, do you all deal with any um, issues with um, maybe car loans? Yes, we do. In the, in the consumer realm, uh, we deal with automobile loans. We deal with uh, payday loans. Payday loans is a big issue as well. Uh, all, all, these, all these avenues that people have pursued trying to basically just meet their day-to-day -day responsibilities, entering into a payday loan, a now, trusted isn't, loan. Yes. Isn't payday loans illegal in Maryland, or is it not, or is it clear? The thing about payday loans is it's a, they're online. It's not like I'm walking into a store in Maryland and getting a payday loan. 
you can go online and that's really between the person pursuing the loan and the person on the other end where we don't know where they may be and they're depositing the money directly into your bank account. So, so yes, there may be illegal and limits on the, the interest rates that can be charged, that these astronomical interest rates, 500% on the money, 200% uh, on the money, uh, it still happens, okay? Uh, scams are illegal too, but it doesn't <laughs> stop them from happening. Um, and, and I'll say this to H in Prince George's County, uh, homeowners associations, uh, people are falling behind in the homeowners association. They're barely able to pay their mortgage to add on a few hundred dollars for an HO homeowners association or a condo association fee and you get behind. Um, there's special protections for these groups. Uh, they can put a lien on your property and file for foreclosure just as easily as uh, a mortgage company can. And again, um, for a smaller amount, it almost seems for for smaller amounts yeah. too. And and what are the resources from uh, from a legal standpoint to assist the client? Again, a lot of it is we're not disputing that the debt is owed. Okay, there is a valid contract in place. We're doing our best to uh, bring attention to the issue uh, that homeowners are in need and trying to negotiate just a, uh, a, better re a better result than taking someone's home or putting a lien on their, their home. Uh, and, and, and it's tough work, but we do help a great number of people. Uh, it is satisfying in that respect. Uh, and again, um, if you're facing these problems, what we really want you to know is that we're a service, we're here for you, we're free, and we want people to contact us. So if you want people want to contact you, how do they contact you? A number of ways to contact us. Like I said, we have 12 agencies across the state. Um, if you just, if you have access to the internet, you can go online. You can visit our website. What's your website? website? MDLab.org. So MDLab.org. You can see all of our services, all of our uh, offices across the state. And if they want to call you, you can call us. Uh, our number at the headquarters is 410-951. 7700 and that will connect you with all of the other departments. Again, there are local uh, Maryland Legal Aid offices in Prince George's County. We're in the Largo, Hyattsville area. Um, and if they call that number, they will be able to get in contact with Yes, and if right. it's a specialty unit, you'll be referred to that specialty unit. Okay, and if they wanted to email you for clarification or anything, do you, what's your email? My email is A Davis at mdlab.org. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very for coming much for on the show. Um, as you all can see, we got some invaluable information today. If you have concerns, please contact the Maryland Legal Aid. Thank you for joining us at Chat with the Lawyer. My son had a drinking problem at college. I had no idea things could get so much worse so fast. A friend suggested we try Al-Anon family groups, even though our son claimed his drinking was no big deal. I didn't want to go to an Al-Anon meeting, but I'm sure glad I went. Is someone's drinking troubling you? You might be surprised at what you can learn in an Al-Anon family group from people just like you. Call one 888 for Al-Anon or go to alanon.org. Space technology. It's all around us. Think safety, medicine, transportation, energy, communications, and thousands of products we enjoy and depend on every day. Technologies originally developed for space exploration make life better here on Earth. The Space Foundation wants you to know Space is for all of us. Learn more at spacecertification.org.